I want to take the lens of negotiating identity and uh, I want to say that the lens of negotiating identity serves as a window into a better understanding of what of the non-Christians to whom we want to minister. And uh, I've chosen non-Christians here, but, but uh, because that's, I need to focus a little bit more. But uh, I think that this lens also lends itself towards uh, understanding and ministering to Christians as well. The second uh, main major point that I'm going to be focusing on is the lens of negotiating identity helps us to more adequately prepare so that we can address issues that surface in our interactions with non-Christians. And then finally, not only understanding, not only preparing, but engaging. The lens of negotiating identity helps us to strategically engage those non-Christians to which we are uh, uh, wanting to, to which we are ministering. So first, uh, let's just go with the first point there. The lens of negotiating identity serves as a window into a better understanding of the non-Christians to which we want to minister. And I'm going to start with by just saying this window helps us pinpoint what we're trying to understand about non-Christians. So when we inter engage them, uh, we want to, we, what do we want to know about? Uh, what do we want to know about what they're thinking and how they're acting? And I'm just going to highlight uh, several, five points here. First of all, they, how they stand in regard to the, the, the issues that divide or dif differentiate people in their context. And how do people stand, how do non-Christians stand in regard to the issues that divide people in their context? The reason we want to know is because we want to get close to them and we want to stand on their side if we're going to be next to them and looking at the world with them and discussing issues with them. Okay, the second thing that we want to do, and it's obvious from what we've been talking about, the cultural stuff that is shaping uh, them and being asked, accessed by them in the process of, of, of the, the identification of, or the process of identification. What are the tools that surface often? What do you keep hearing them say? What do they, what are the, what do you see them do? What are the things that they are choosing from their, their cultural stuff to make important and to, and to use? The um, third issue is the negative categorizations that non-Christians have about Christianity and the roots of those categorizations. People may, might uh, uh, have uh, surface a, a negative categorization uh, in one context, but surface another categorization in another context. And so we want to be able to kind of understand where they are in this particular context and, and the roots of those categorizations. Then uh, I, uh, uh, the fourth uh, thing that we're looking to pinpoint, uh, we're, what we're trying to understand is the reasons for fixity and fluidity in these negative categorizations. Why are they resistant to change? Uh, and why are they changing? And these are, these are important things that can help us as we uh, engage, seek to engage them and as we seek to prepare. Then, then the fifth point is the physical or, uh, let's say, geographical and social locations. When I talk about a location, I mean um, how I'm located according to a, a word or a, an action or a, 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 a value. I value uh, Hakka or I really uh, despise my Hakka identity. These are all locations. These are all locations, and location, a social location, might be a location in, in a power relationship in a family. I'm a senior member of a family as opposed to I'm a child in this family, and so the social locations. So the physical or geographical and social locations where the voices for God among them are particularly weak and non-existent, and where the responses to widespread negative categorizations are ineffective or have yet to be developed. And so what I'm saying is we're looking for places where the voice of God is, is weak or, or non-existent. And so because we want also to be able to, to uh, as a church, to send people to speak the voice of God into that, into that setting. In the second, uh, uh, second way this land serves as a window into a better understanding of non-Christians is that it serves as a window that helps us determine how we can more effectively go about gaining a better understanding of non-Christians. Uh, I'm just going to highlight 
a couple of pitfalls. And this is going to be a little, uh, little discursus right now into the, the issue of people, a, a term that, you, that you've heard and mi referred to in mission, mis mission circles and in missiology, the study of missions. Uh, we use the word for people group. Uh, and to talk about groups of people. Um, these, uh, we understand, uh, and I'm saying that what we want to, uh, one of the pitfalls that we fall into is that we assume that groups of people are homogeneous and clearly bounded. Now this is, I'm going to give an example of the Hakka in Taiwan, but I'm going to also apply that to in, in, in settings that we're, we're in here. And, and this is a um, this is uh, some of the problems that, that come up when we talk about a people group. Uh, we assume, it's easy to assume that these groups are clearly separate from other groups. As you can see, I have four different circles here. And that, that there, is a group, there is a group way. So you can see each of the groups has people that are different colors. And people act in a certain way. And that, and that once we get the gospel inside of here, that, that these people can share the gospel in ways that, that as an insider, that will, that will facilitate the, 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 the spreading of the gospel in, in, um, in much, much faster. The primary attraction of the people group perspective is the way that it allows Christian workers to divide the world's population into easy to think categories of people often already being used by others. So we can, we can use a people group like, like we could include homosexuals, or we could include, um, we could include uh, any kind of an ethnic group, um, and anything that we can think of as a people group, which feel much more manageable than the whole to talk about, to seek to understand and to engage in ministry. These groups easily come to be seen as internally homogenous, well-bounded, and clearly distinct from other groups. When an individual is perceived to belong to a particular people group, it easily follows for many that their thinking and actions, to a significant extent, are predictable. And as a result, evangelism and church planning strategies can, that uniquely fit people in this group can be developed. Insiders in these groups are assumed to, ha assumed to have a common affinity with other, others that is salient in every situation and that, especially in the case of an ethno-linguistic group, members have a primary loyalty to the group. <laughs> Further, once the gospel is understood to have penetrated group boundaries, uh, many of these Christian workers expect this good news to spread more naturally through the group as insiders rather than outsiders share with other insiders. This has been my thinking as I've been involved with the Hakka uh, Lutheran Brother and International Mission Hakka Ministries in Taiwan. I went to Taiwan. I learned to be as Hakka as possible. Uh, being Hakka, being uh, as Hakka as possible in Taiwan makes me a celebrity. I get to be on, uh, can be on TV. I get to be interviewed. People are fascinated. Why are you, why are you interested in why, are you, why have you learned to speak Hakka? Some people say, you know, you're more Hakka than we are. Um, our ministry team has made ministry, as, uh, our ministry, uh, the Hakka dimension of our ministry as, as, as Hakka as possible. We have a Hakka consciousness. We wear shirts that say, I love Hakka. Uh, we, uh, we sing Hakka songs. We speak Hakka. And we eat Hakka food, and we, we read the Hakka Bible, etc. But the problem is, is that things don't go the way that we expected, at least for me. Hakkas aren't always as Hakka as I expected. You know, when I first came to Taiwan, I had this treasure. Uh, shortly, after I, shortly after I got there, the, the Hakka New Testament was, was translated. Uh, and it was, was in in Hakka characters, and then romanization on the side. And I, I loved it. I carried it with me when I went to visit people. When I prepared sermons, I opened it, and I, and I used it. Um, to, and I could, I could say things. I knew how to say Bible things in Hakka. And um, when I uh, came back to, uh, 
get married. Actually, it was at the time when I came back from, I got married. I married this nurse from Cameroon, and I stole her from Cameroon, our Cameroon field, and brought her to Taiwan. And when we came to Taiwan, we learned, we, she, she, I had already learned to speak Hakka, and one of the things that we did was we learned, we, we tried to get into a Hakka family, and we picked the, the, the family in our Hakka church that was the most, that was a traditional Hakka, that was the most traditional Hakka. And so she, she and I lived together in that, in that house with them for a whole month. And at the end of that time, you know, you want to give them a, uh, do something. So we were, we were going to give them some, a gift. They wouldn't take a gift. They wouldn't take money. And so I came up with a brilliant idea. The Hakka Bible, New Testament had just come out. And I said, I have an idea. I'm going to. I'm going to give some Hakka Bibles to our church because I wanted to use the, the Hakka Bible. I wanted everybody in our church to use the Hakka Bible. I want to I give Hakka Bibles in your name to the church. And, and very uncharacteristically, um, the people in our church, this, this couple said to me, and typically a Chinese is very indirect, she said, she said to me uh, and, and voiced their, both of their opinion, if Absolutely not. You cannot give Hakka Bibles to our church in, in, in our name. I said to myself, what is wrong with you people? Aren't you Hakka? And uh, as, I, as I went and talked to my, my colleague, uh, David Lee, at the time, I said, David, what do you, what do you think? Um, why do you, why, what, what should I do? And he said, well, why don't you talk to other people? And as I talked to other people in, our, in the church at that time, many of them expressed that desire. We don't want to use the Hakka Bible. And my response at that time was, was, come on, people. We're trying to reach Hakkas. Come on, people. Be willing to sacrifice. I know it's a new thing, but let's sacrifice. And yet, and, and uh, things go on. I started seeing things. I started realizing you know, there's a, de a denomination in our in our in our church that in our in in our circles in Taiwan that's that's targeted on Hakka. They say we're a Hakka church, and yet none of them used used the Hakka language as the primary language in their church. They always had a secondary service, and it was usually for older people if they had it, and most of the time they didn't. And <coughs> I saw. When I came back to Taiwan, came back to the United States to go to Trinity, uh, shortly about six months after I came back to the United States, I got a phone call from, from, Dave, from, uh, from David, and, and he said, uh, Pastor, I just want you to know that we just made a decision that we're not going to use Hakka, the Hakka language, anymore in our church. And I thought to myself, as, uh, of course, one side of me understood what was, begin was beginning to understand what was going on. I thought to myself, you know, if anybody can get this, this church has had missionaries, Joel, Joel and Mary Beth Norvet, f working with them uh, for a significant amount of time, and, and Mike and Dolores Kittleson for a, s a short time, and, and our, my wife and I working with them for a long time. And if any church could get it, this church should be the one. And, and so many different examples, and not only in our church circles, but one of the things that frustrates uh, those who are, are trying to save the Hakka culture in Taiwan. As I interviewed people, I found that, that there were, they were frustrated because when uh, they, they, they came up with this idea of, of, uh, of helping young people learn Hakka. So they went to, to elementary schools and, they, and they, started a, then they got it passed so that all schools could teach mother tongue classes. And so, of course, there were Hakka classes and then there was Hokulo classes. Uh, which is a majority people group in Taiwan, and then some places Aborigine classes. And the Hakka parents would put their kids in the Hoklo language classes because they wanted their kids to learn to speak the majority language, and they thought it was a great opportunity. And, and these, these activists were furious. Why? And they said, well, the, the parents said, well, we can teach our, our kids at home. We can teach Hakka at home. The problem is it wasn't happening, and so, so um, as uh, as my as as I studied the case of the Hakka ethnic uh, group, these expectations don't often correspond. The, the expectations that that um, 
that there will be a homo homogeneous, you, uh, homogeneous group that will be separate and there's a certain way that's in the group and, and an affinity that makes them make sharing, e sharing the gospel easier. These expectations often don't correspond with the complex realities found in ministry settings. For example, Christian workers often encounter a great deal of variety in the thinking and actions of people identified or categorized to be in a particular people group. It doesn't matter if it's an ethnic group. If you look at, at the group we call homosexuals, you'll find a, a great deal of variety uh, within that group uh, and other groups like them. The people group identity of, of individuals they encounter in ministry is not always the most salient identity they have. And these individuals often trust and feel more affinity with and are more loyal to those who are not considered to be group insiders. Group boundaries are often fuzzy and even porous. Consequently, predicting how someone identified to, or categorized to be in a particular people group will think or act is difficult, sometimes difficult. And expecting that individuals perceived to be in a group will trust and feel affinity with and loyalty to other people group insiders in a way that will be significantly helpful in spreading the gospel among insiders is often unrealistic. The influence of problematic expectations is great. Often large amounts of energy and resources are invested to seek to understand a kind of person envisioned to be in a particular people group and develop tools that will enable Christian workers to evangelize and plant churches in ways that fit with this kind of person and those like him or her. When these strategies and tools are used in actual ministry settings, settings where there is a great variety of the way people are thinking and acting, they are limited in their effectiveness and the well-intentioned and sacrificial investments made do not facilitate the spread of the gospel in the way expected. Um, sometimes a heavy emphasis on a people group can be an, become an obstacle that separates you from the, from the people that you're trying to reach. Well, we don't... Uh, we think we can think of people groups, and I know many of many churches are doing ethnic ministries, and and uh, uh, one of the people groups, the 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 places where this lands in our culture today is that is uh, the Hispanics, Chinese, Japanese, Somalis, Koreans, and Native Americans around us. How do we view them? It's tempting to view these people in each of these groups statically, not realizing that one that that to one ethnic identity is very important, while others. Young, uh, while well, to others it is not. They may not even, even like the language of the culture that's associated with ethnicity. And sometimes we make, uh, we think about uh, groups of people that live in urban or, or we categorize people as urban or country. And, and there are places in this, global, in this globalized world where even in rural areas there are people living who may be working on the internet and and they, they live next to someone who has lived in that area for a long time and, and another person who has just moved in and, and is, is like a stockbroker on the, on the internet or something and, and living in a country location. And so even in a country location and in, and in, a, in an urban setting, there's great, great variety. Sometimes we use uh, categories like boomers and busters and mosaics uh, to talk about age differences. And yet, within those age differences, it's very important to think, to realize that, that there, is, there is a variety of, of, of uh, there's great variety. When people identify themselves as Muslim or Buddhist or some of the other identities that you come up, that you come up against, it's very important to understand that, there, that, that, that those, within those categories, there is not, it's not as, as we often imagine that, that, um, that there are uh, well-bounded groups and that people, are, uh, people within them are homogen, homogenized, homog homogeneous. Okay, the second uh, pitfall that I want to emphasize is responding to negative categorizations of non-Christians on an idea level alone without exploring and addressing the complexities associated with these categorizations. Oftentimes, we get a we get, uh, we respond very, we very quickly go to a, a, a stance where we, where we're, where we're uh, debate, almost in, in debating, um, in debate mode. So last, uh, give you an example, last semester I taught a class at the ha Christian Hakka Seminary. 
And I, one of the assignments that I gave my students was to go out and to find, uh, talk to non-Christians that they knew and find six negative categorizations and then pick two of them to develop uh, some responses to it. And uh, one of my students went out and talked to a non-Christian and, and he said, oh, Christianity has been discredited by science. And she came back and she said, I, I, she wrote down what she was planning to do. She said, I'm going to, and she was asking me for books. Give me some books that I can, that I can uh, respond to him. And I said, I told her, I said, you need to go back and you need to find out. What, what is, why is he saying that? What is, is he really interested in science? Has he understood, does he understand, has he read a lot in science and needs to, to be, uh, uh, needs to have some, uh, some engagement of some of the issues that he's been re uh, dealing with. And my suspicions were true, were, were accurate as she went out and she found out that the issue that was behind his negative categorization was the fact that, that, that he, she, he felt that, that all religions are the same, that you've heard that negative categorization, and I have what I want, and you're, a, you're one of those Christians who's trying to get me, and I'm going to stop you. And I've heard people say that, and so, so I'm going to just throw it out and trip you up because I know it will be hard for you to deal with. And so the issue, the real issue that was, that was something that was an obstacle for him was to overcome the idea that all religions are the same. And, that, uh, and so it changed totally her, her, uh, her response. Sometimes our, our, um, uh, we can see the non-Christians as a, as a puzzle piece. And we, we come up with these puzzle pieces. And, and uh, you know, we think they make sense. Uh, a gospel presentation or a, or a response to a, an issue and, and yet, yet they, don't, they don't do anything. They don't, they don't address, they don't match what the person needs. And I'm not saying that those things are, are not important, but, but they need to be part of a bigger, a bigger strategy, a, a strategy of understanding, uh, understanding people. I read recently about a, uh, an, an art, uh, a story in a, in, a in a book that I read, and uh, it was, uh, here's the account. It was about a Buddhist in the United States. One day I was talking to a Chinese lady in an apartment for several minutes, and she talked about how wonderful Buddhism was. Okay, wait a minute. Now I'm going to stop for a second. Buddhism. What is it? Okay, uh, what does she mean by Buddhism? Uh, what is, what, what, why does she say that she's Buddhist? Does she always say she's Buddhist? Many people in Taiwan identify themselves as Buddhist, but there's a variety of, of beliefs that are associated with this term. There is Buddhism that's organized high and institutionalized, official and book. And then there's a folk religion. And people, the average person in Taiwan, even though that's a, they, they believe a mixture of a lot of things call themselves Buddhists. These are all different, and we need to explore the meanings that this person had has associated with that identity. Okay, I'm going to continue. And so, at the appropriate time, I asked her, "But you don't? But don't you know that a, as a parent, good things? Uh, don't you, as a parent, desire good things for your children? You see, in Buddhism, he writes, you're supposed to get a, get rid of all desires." And she, she was quiet for a moment. She realized, he says, he, she realized her actions didn't match her beliefs. And after a long pause, what does that mean? Um, she said to me, well, I've been a Buddhist for only a year. You should ask my mother. And because I took the time to carefully and graciously reveal one crack in her belief about Buddhism, she was willing to hear what I had to say next about Jesus. And, and my, uh, as I look at it, I, can, I, I understand, I, I just want to make the point that, that uh, a lot of times we go to the, the debate. We go and we, and we throw out that, 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 uh, that argument. And, uh, and we don't really try to understand what they mean by that. And, and when the pause comes and she's paused, there's a lot of things that could have been happening. As What is this guy talking about? Or... Um, or, yeah, I, I don't know if I want to talk about this. And it, it's not so much a, 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 a response that says, you're right and I'm wrong. And now I'm going to come and, and, uh, and take the next step and listen to, listen to Jesus, listen to you talk about Jesus. And uh, sometimes we debate with non-Christians on an ideal level. 
and and we we miss some of the some of the opportunities that we have to really address some of the underlying issues. Why did she become a Buddhist a year ago? What was her relationship to her mother in this regard? And when we know more, we can find ways to speak truth into her life. Perhaps a better way would be to raise uh, would, would be to raise other issues with her. We need to address the issues that are underlying. Think about it how it is for you. If somebody, if you're in a discussion with a non-Christian or a Mormon or, or, or a Jehovah's Witness and they ask a question that you cannot easily answer, what happens in your mind? Uh, do you accept that non-Christian's point of view? Usually not. There's more going on. There's more behind the way that you answer the, this question. But... If the Holy Spirit is working in this person, and the question raised about truth uh, was truth with a capital T, then over a period of time you might begin to doubt the one thing about your religious belief that was that was raised. Finally, I, uh, in this area, I want to just raise the issue of uh, expecting too much too quickly, and just highlight that sometimes. I have the expectation, and I think a lot of people have the expectation, that we want to bring someone to faith in one conversation, and we plan our strategies accordingly. And often, uh, as we have a certain, uh, we have a certain amount of inf information that we want to disperse to them, dispense to them, rather than looking at a uh, using a wise, one step at a time, understanding where they are at, and learning and, and uh, uh, adjusting our strategy accordingly. Second major point under this, this lens helps us to know how to gain a better understanding by highlighting the importance of exploring what experts are saying about our culture in general and the response of non-Christians to Christians and Christianity. Um, there's a lot of books, uh, cultural, and I'm not going to go into them. Uh, some of them are on your bibliography that I handed out. Um, and just books of, of, of works that have been, uh, of authors that have really addressed, uh, tried to understand culture and the culture of America, the culture of different places in the world, sometimes websites. I remember from Joel Christensen's presentation last year at J-Term, uh, reading good literature, trying to understand the stories that people tell to what it feels like to live as a, as a non-Christian in, in and live in a certain way. I, I, have, I have set myself about to, to read, try to read more, try to read Chinese novels, actively thinking about what is being said as, they, as I interact there. We want to be careful as we read others to not assume that, 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 we're, that we're figuring out a certain way, the Chinese way, the homosexual way, the the, uh, the, the boomer way or the, or the buster way. We need to be careful because many of the authors were, that are thinking about issues in, uh, that non-Christians raise on an are thinking on an ideal level and not always trying to address how things are related to other facets of life and the interactions with them. Third point I want to highlight here is uh, this lens helps us to know how to gain a better understanding by highlighting the importance of doing and supporting research projects designed to support the thinking and uh, designed to explore the thinking and actions of non-Christians, both in general and specifically as they relate to Christians and Christianity. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do in our ministry in Taiwan is to is to is to, uh, is to begin to do more in a formal way. And of course we can do this on an informal way as we interact with, with non-Christians and, and uh, in, in conversations with them. But to do research on a more formal level, and we're considering the possibility of studying a temple uh, and the people who are engaged, engaging the supernatural there and trying to understand the different ways that they relate and the motivations behind it. Things are changing. We need to continually be updating our understanding of people and their response to Christ and, and the contributions of, of others, either by books or through research, are very important and it's important to support those kinds of things. By highlighting, another lens, the way this lens helps us to gain a better understanding is by highlighting the importance of exploring different aspects of what the non-Christians we are engaging 
are thinking, and both, both in general and specifically as they relate to, to Christianity, trying to understand as best we can the way the particu a particular person thinks. We, uh, the spectrum of possible ways of thinking that are available to this person, what's available in their, in their, in their cultural stuff, their, the tool, toolbox. In this process, we not only gain understandings, but also communicate that we value the person. When we engage people as learners, we often gain the insight. We often gain the right to speak later, and we can see how they are located in the midst of their world. Each dimension of the process of negotiating identity provides a touch point to explore. The different aspects of this process also help us to isolate problem areas. When we know what some of the issues that are used to differentiate people that come up in regard to Christianity in a particular physical or social location, we can ask them how they feel or understand in these areas. And when we come to understand the complexities of the way people are interacting, we can raise these areas with new people to find out how they are thinking. I'll just give you an example of how this, this kind of a thinking, uh, this kind of uh, accessing something that you've discovered can can happen and one of the things that uh, as I as I've been involved in doing research I've gone to gone to a temple and I've stood and participated in in various uh, uh, part various uh, festivities there I remember going to one temple and I saw it at the beginning it was a three-day festival and at the beginning the god of the underworld came and it was kind of a uh, a temporary, uh, temporary image. He came in with a with a, a piece of paper over his face, and then he was put in his location. And then, then he uh, and he was to oversee the festivities that were happening during Ghost Month, and and he uh, and and then there was a ritual that was performed to activate him to to call the the God of the Underworld to fill this uh, image that was there. And then he he oversaw, and at the end. Um, I was walking around and I just was having a lot of fun talking to people, fun in a way that, it, that it's, I'm learning a ton of things. And, and there was an older man, he was, he was probably in his 80s, and he came in and he, he, he learned, he, he was curious about me, and then when he found out I was trying to learn about the temple, he took me all over and he showed me all kinds of things. He said, I come here every year at this time because the spirits here protect me. And I want to acknowledge that and to worship them. And as we were, as the, as uh, as everybody was kind of cleaning up, I was talking to him, and all of a sudden, uh, they start to move the God of the underworld. They move him out to, and he's starting to leave. He's going out into the courtyard, out into the plaza in front of the temple, and sitting there, waiting for the ritual to send him back. And as I as I, as I saw it moving, I grabbed my camera. I said, I, wanna, you know, I said to myself, I want to take a picture. He saw me, and he said, he said, he ran, and he grabbed me by the arm. He said, don't look, don't look. And he grabbed me, and he ran me as fast as I could to the other side of the, temp, uh, other side of the plaza. And I thought, what is, what is, what, what's going on? And, and he explained to me, if you look, if you look, he'll take you with him. Well, I have this, this, this story, and it moved me. This man was so concerned about me that he would, that he would try to keep me from being harmed. He was so, he was so genuine in his, in his, and I could feel the fear just shaking in his bones as he, as he told me. And, and so a story like that becomes, an, and uh, I can tell that story to, my, to, to a non-Christian Friend. And I could say, what do you think about that? And it becomes a beautiful entry into a conversation, um, a conversation about what is, it, what is it like to feel? And well, how do you feel about the spirits? And how do you feel about the underworld? And how do you feel about some of the things that, that are important? And, and so, so um, uh, these kinds of experiences as we're, and as we're engaging, as we learn more about other people, we can say we can bring them up in conversations with other people, uh, not other non-Christians, as we're seeking to to understand and to to help them understand. Okay, I've given you a handout there. It's entitled "Some Sample Exploratory Questions," 
And each of these has, each of the issues that I brought up in the previous session have, uh, I, I've list, listed some questions there, but they're not, it's not by any means, you, you can probably come up with more, more better questions than I've come up with. Um, and every time I look at it, I want to add some other questions and, 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 and think about that are, that are really helpful. I want to just add, uh, just, just say as I, uh, under the, the first, uh, and I'm just going to take a couple of these, the Bible, um, what I've listed for you there are some questions that, that really relate to what is this person's perception of God and, his, and the way the world is, the way that God has set up the context. But I think an, a question to add there uh, is that what is God doing in this person's life and what has he already accomplished? And, you know, that seems to be, the reason I didn't write it down is because it seems to be obvious. But I thought, as I thought about it, as I was preparing this morning, I thought, no, that really is something to keep at the forefront as we, as we interact. Okay, I'm going to go down to the smile thought bubble, uh, number G. How does this person understand well-being? What is, what, and this is a, this is a really fruitful, uh, fruitful, it's been very fruitful for me in understanding a person. What are they trying to, what are they trying to achieve? What does this person feel that he or that she has to do to gain or lose well-being? Who does this person believe can help her achieve well-being, hinder her from achieving it, cause her to lose it? How does this person's way reflect their understanding of well-being? And I, I found that to be very, very helpful. Um, the, the issue of number L, conversation bubbles. What are key symbols, words, labels that this person is using? And from their perspective, from her perspective, what are the meanings attached to these symbols? Symbols like God. You know, we all know that, that you can't, that in the postmodern world, we can't just assume that people understand what, what we mean by God. But other things, like when Christians say that we're sheltered or boring or un, un, unintelligent or old-fashioned or out of touch with reality or judgmental, um, what do they mean by that? What, what, are they, what, are the, what, is, what are the roots of those issues? How did they come? Is it through experience or through uh, uh, talking to other people? Uh, the the issue in number number n. I'm using toilet paper as a as a, a symbol for habit. How is what this person's saying related to their habits? Uh, these habits cause them to see differences in Christianity. How does it related to traditions? Has he always had these habits or traditions? How, ha, have they ever changed? Uh, did when did this when did the, he first follow these traditions or habits? How does he feel about them? In this person's mind, what do the habits, traditions achieve? How would this person feel if he were forbidden from doing these things? What are some other habits or traditions that this person has had and given up at other times in their life? Why the changes? And as we, uh, as we, um, uh, as we discover some of their habits, and uh, we, we can deal with them differently than, than, than an issue that is, and, and sometimes the, uh, uh, problematizing an, a, a, a habit, uh, we deal with it differently than if it's it's something that is 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 kind of a, a, a something that they have worked through and they've decided to believe, and oftentimes it's very fruitful to to be able to raise the question, um, where where did these habits come from, and, and or perhaps in the area of tradition, where did these traditions come from? Okay, then. Uh, how does this, the area O, heart, how does, what does this person say, how does what this person is saying relate to her need for belonging, continuity, and certainty? In what situations does this person feel a sense of belonging, continuity, and certainty? And is there anything about Christians or Christianity that threatens this, this sense of belonging or continuity or, or certainty? Um, Anytime we question established beliefs, there is a threat to the certainty that they have built their lives upon. And rather than addressing ideas, we can address that as an underlying issue um, and address this feeling of uncertainty because it's different. Okay, then uh, I've used the uh, cut out people. I want to focus on that for a second. What stereotypes does this person have of Christians or Christianity? 
when a Christian constructs her response to Christianity, does she have a particular person or persons as ex in mind as exemplars of Christianity? Who are they? Uh, what is this exemplar? What are these exemplars like? Okay, so these are these are some uh, just some examples of these sample questions. Now I'm going to jump to the to the next point. I want to make I want to say this, if we're not willing to sacrifice time and energy to try to understand things from their perspective, how they are located in, in religious terms, uh, and how this fits with, with, uh, with how they, others are identifying this in this area, we will often make big mistakes in two, two, uh, two large uh, areas. Uh, the, the areas that we're going to be talking about in our next main points, making preparations to engage and then engaging them. We will not be able to build on an environment where a person feels valuable or able to compare this person's ideas with others on the same topic. Okay, then the uh, point C here, this lens serves as a window into a better understanding of non-Christians, a window that helps us to determine which non-Christians we want to minister. You know, uh, those that we, uh, it seems obvious that we minister to those around us whom we're having, we already have something in common with, families, neighbors, uh, family members, neighbors, coworkers, and classmates. Because, um, in fact, we, because we have relationships with them, we are already in some ways negotiating it, even if, negotiating with them, even if we're not conscious of it, or uh, whether we're conscious of it or not. Since deeper connections are hard to make and, a lot of t and take a lot of time, it makes sense to, to seek to deepen those that, these relationships that we already have. And then the second uh, uh, area to, to think about as we determine our ministry target, other Christians around us. Many people don't have a lot of connections with non-Christians, and we need to be content, intentional about getting out of our comfort zone and connecting with people who are different. Non-Christians are often not people we naturally gravitate to. And uh, it's easy to get focused on building Christian commun community and, uh, and to forget about the world. And in uh, the book on Christian, Kinnaman and Lyman, Lyons say, uh, the church has largely lost its heart for outsiders to pay the sacrifices uh, that are necessary to to engage and to and to uh, um, to determine who we want to minister to, I I, I enjoyed reading uh, one part of the that book that that talked about he had he had just gone to uh, to uh, share some of the data that he had gained from a survey with a person who had hired him to do this data, and here's the story he, what he writes he said we were on our way to a small regional airport, passing by fertile strawberry fields of, the, of Ventura County. And while trying to keep my eyes on the road, I was rambling on about research. And I, I didn't realize that this guy was on to a new topic. He says, I wonder if anyone is thinking about connecting those people to Christ, he said. What? I said, what people? And the workers there in the field, he said, pointing out a group of people hunched over the plants, harvesting the berries. I had to strain to see them in the afternoon glare. I wonder who's thinking about their spiritual needs. And that question is a question that we can ask ourselves as we see the non-Christians around us. I wonder if anyone is thinking about connecting those people to Christ. I wonder if anybody is working like a medical doctor trying to diagnose how we can get the gospel, uh, how, how we can bring the gospel, the word of God, closer to them. And then finally, uh, non-Christians located in in where the need is the, is, is the greatest, or uh, greater or greater, greatest. Um, instead of choosing to minister to, a, uh, to think about a primary emphasis on a people group, Christian workers can use the lens of negotiating identity as they search for a geographical or a social location in which to minister. Where are the pe places in your community around the world where the voices of God are non-existent or weak. Christians can, use, can choose to enter those locations where there are few or no Christians available to respond to the identifications and categorizations that relate to being Christian. 
They can also choose locations where the Christian response to one or more negative categorizations is weak or ineffective. They can choose to focus on a location where there is a lack of understanding and necessary tools uh, to effectively contest those categorizations and, prop and presuppositions upon which they are built. We not only need to work where, to, to re, where response narratives are non-existent or weak in effectiveness, but also in, in where the p opposing power structures are strong and well-organized, and where people have been alienated from Christianity by past encounters. Okay, the final, uh, uh, the second point, major point here that I want to <coughs> focus on is the lens of negotiating identity helps us to more adequately prepare so that we can effectively address issues that surface in our interactions with non-Christians. Not only narratives, but also questioning them about the, how they understand experiences, certain experiences. The lens of uh, negotiating identity can help Christian workers engage strategically in interactions with non-Christians in various locations by surfacing the need to develop tools and strategies that will enable them to effectively interact, respond to the prevalent no negative categorizations of being Christian, and to problematize the taken for granted nature of the presuppositions underlying these categorizations. Tools that can be developed include things like stories, literature, okay, I'm talking about contesting negative categorizations, developing stories, literature, illustrations, ways of handling certain problems, uh, top, uh, music, topical music on a certain theme, contextualized rituals, paintings, Bible studies, language abilities, relationships, diagrams, gospel presentations, and the like. The, th the goal is to use, is to bring, is to take the truth uh, as God has revealed it to us and use different methods to communicate and to speak into the, in response to some of the things that are being said. Strategies in this context are plans of how to graciously interact with non-Christians who articulate non negative categorizations of being Christian in such a way that these categorizations, as much as possible, gradually lose their intensity and eventually are deemed unimportant or unsatisfying, unnecessary to raise anymore, and that these non-Christians are able to see themselves as God sees them and have credible opportunities to thoughtfully respond to the good news of the gospel. So um, some of the things that the, using the lens of negotiating identity can help us make preparations that will enable us to effectively uh, prepare by highlighting the importance of living out truth for those in our community to see. We can prepare to live out truth. What I mean by living out truth is to is to live as Christians in, in, the, in the context in, amongst the non-Christians around us. We can prepare to live out this truth by immersing ourselves in the word and the sacraments, helping us to understand and to have the, have the strength and the, and the wisdom to be able to live as God, uh, as God wants us to live. We can prepare to live out this truth by connecting with non-wise Christians in our fields whether it's uh, maybe construction or academia or farming or fi the financial sector or music or, or even retired people. Who can, these people who can help us understand the unique challenges that Christians in our grouping face and how to handle them. Um, and, uh, you know, the importance of, of, of consulting people who, who, have, who have wisdom and who have... Uh, who have life experience to be able to share, and not all people who have who have who are elderly or who have have experience have good experience, and so some of those things is is learning how to uh, to learn from people who are wise, who can help us to learn to to deal with some of the uh, challenges that we face. We can prepare to live out this truth by developing strategies to handle, rather than to avoid sticky problems. In, uh, in advance. And I'm just going to use the illustration here of, of, of uh, this, uh, of ghost month uh, s uh, sacrifices that are done on a regular basis. Uh, during the month of, uh, usually it's the lunar month, the seventh month of the lunar calendar. Um, there are 
uh, it's the ghost month. It's called Ghost Month. It's usually August, uh, in August, and mostly in Aug late July and in August. Um, and people are, uh, uh, people, uh, the, the gates of hell are opened. And the, the spirits that are there that are, are allowed to roam around. And they're allowed to, uh, allowed freedom for a while. And so there are sacrifices that are offered to them. And, and one, of the, one of the challenges that came up as I interviewed, talked to people, is you know, one person told me, said, she said, you know, uh, I was sitting in my office and uh, in my company, and, and I knew that they were preparing the sacrifices down on the street outside and every one of the employee went down there and did the did the worship of the of the hungry of the hungry ghosts these spirits and but I didn't go down and my boss came up and he said what are you doing how come you're not coming down and I he, she said I told him I said I can't do that I'm not I I don't I don't believe in that kind of thing and he said are you gonna are you going to uh, be willing to take the responsibility if something happens in our company because of your unwillingness to participate? She said to me, what could I do? How could I handle it? And she hadn't, she hadn't prepared, she hadn't talked in advance. And so, uh, so she, she didn't know what to do. And it's the same case in, in, uh, when it comes time to worship the ancestors, to participate in ancestor rituals at, at, the, at the time of Chinese New Year, which happens to be next, next uh, Next Sunday, I think you can pray for for, for uh, Christians in in areas where where uh, in in Taiwan especially where there's tremendous pressure on them to participate in some of the rituals in their family. What's a plan in advance? What are you going to do at tomb sweeping when people are going to are are when the ancestor rituals are going to happen? Is there something that you can do? And there are strategies that 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 many wise Christians have developed that can handle these kinds of situations. Okay, then, then I'm going to focus on uh, this lens helps us to more adequately prepare by highlighting the importance of building strategic connections with non-Christians. We, um, we can avoid being, uh, we can build strategic connections with non-Christians by seeking to move in harmony with them as much as possible. Because we understand, we've done the research, we understand how they relate to issues that differentiate people in society. We can, we can and some, sometimes we can stand with them on a particular issue. We can honor their values, use their wording, respect their habits. In other words, we can defer to and respect their locations and identi identities. To identify with them. People like to be around those that value and accept them. In some ways, this means joining their world. Paul Hebert talks about missionaries being bicultural people who are at most at home in the airplane because they're, they're, because they're going home. Who are most at home in the airplane when they're going home, no matter which way they're flying. Paul Hebert says, as missionaries, we need to identify as closely with the, as possible with the people among whom we serve. For in doing so, we are able to carry the gospel farther across the bicultural bridge. We are simultaneously members of two or more cultures, different cultures, and do not identify fully with any of them. This reality can be unsettling as we may feel marginalized from our, our own culture and not fully accepted by the host culture. I raise this not, not to talk about missionaries, but to raise it as a, as a challenge to each of us to identify with non-Christians 
Um, sometimes the most effective evangelists are those who, 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 are, uh, who have identified so well with, their non, with, with others that they, they sometimes might experience this unsettling, being, feeling marginalized in their own, among their own kinds of people. The importance of Christian laboring, Christian workers laboring to, laboring to understand the ways and the extent to which people are, ident- are attempting to evangel, they, they are attempting to evangelize, are relating to their identity, and working to develop understandings and skills that enable them to relate appropriately and strategically, as they interact with people who are located differently in this process is really evident. People, workers can ask questions like. For example, in, in the ethnic identity, when do you speak or not speak the ethnic an- language of interest? When do you feel the most or least ethnic, of, uh, like Hakka? Um, this strategic sensitivity may mean doing things in a way that affirms how each, how each individual or group in each context is relating to their identity. So for Hakkas, having ministry being only be as Hakka or haka in the way of the haka individuals or group with one whom one is interacting, currently interacting. For example, in the area of language used to communicate, the Christian worker would ideally follow the language habits of each person with whom they are interacting. Practically in contexts where there is more than one language commonly used, this means developing language skills to be able to build relationships and interact about being Christian in one of the many or many languages that the individuals and group or groups is trying is using in trying to uh, those that those that we're trying to evangelize are in the habit of using. This sensitivity may also mean sometimes for strategic reasons, deliberately positioning oneself in ways that fit with only one way of relating to an ethnic identity. Uh, for example, uh, for example, some Christian workers can choose to physically locate themselves among those in a particular area whose ethnic identity is consistently very salient and reflect that salience in their ministry by using the, the language or cultural stuff in ways that would be appropriate in this setting and not others. We can build strategic uh, relationships by cultivating strategic postures, that of a learner, of a servant, we can build strategic co- connections with non-Christians by seeking positions of influence in our vocation. And this comes from a book that Joel Christensen, I, I found it interesting when I listened on the way out here, I listened to Joel Christensen's presentation last, some, last, last year. And he raised, uh, he did an did a evaluation of the book by James, uh, James uh, uh, Hunter. Um, forgotten his last, uh, James Hunter, and uh, James Davison Hunter, and How to Change the World. And, and uh, Hunter ha- comes with the perspective, he calls it the, 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 the concept of faithful presence. And he, uh, he says, get into elite positions in our field and support others to do that. He says, he says raise up people that fit to excel in every calling, not just in, the, in theology or in the church, and, and have them be positioned so that not so that they're just present there, but so that they can proclaim and speak for God into the issues that come up in those, issue, in those areas. And Hunter is especially emphasizes the, the need to, to have people in elite positions where they're speaking not as a not like in a parallel institution like often we in, Christ, in Christianity have developed parallel institutions uh, like educational institutions, um, but in the fields, in the thick of, of, of each, each calling and each field, and in, I use the word vocation in our, uh, in our, in our life and in our world and, and speak God's voice in a way that's authoritative in those, in those uh, settings. <laughs> So not only getting into those positions ourselves, but as a church, working to support people, to raise people up, to excel in those in, in every calling, so that they can they can be, be God's voice there. Okay, this lens helps us to more adequately prepare C by highlighting the importance of developing 
effective responses to the negative categorizations of Christianity that have, that have surfaced. And part of this, I want to use the word um, Oops. Uh, we can, uh, part of this, we can develop effective responses to problematize these negative categorizations and or assumptions on which they are built and develop alternative narratives that can be added to the cultural stuff of the non-Christians who, are, are, who articulated these categorizations. A really important word here is the word problematize. Um, and this root, this word has, is a, in some ways it's, it's obvious, but it has a root in, in a, a really liberal uh, Brazilian educator named Paulo Ferreri. For, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Um, Ferreri, whose writings included the book Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And he was writing about, uh, he was writing as an educator on how to help, how to help the oppressed in Brazil uh, kind of wake up and to step out of their their, their world and to see how, how there were people that were oppressing him, pressing them, rather than just trying to work their way up in this, in this little grouping of oppressed that they were so that they became the ones who were less oppressed and could oppress those underneath them. And, and uh, he called this, this idea of helping, having them get out, step back, and take a look as problematizing their, their setting. Rather than taking common knowledge or, or one perspective of a situation for granted, problematizing poses that, that knowledge, or in our case, stuff, uh, as a, it's a problem. In other words, it suggests that this knowledge is to, well, can be treated as if it were still up for discussion, allowing space for new understandings and perspectives on this knowledge to emerge. And uh, he, he focuses on helping instead of Instead of giving people the solution, instead of giving people the, the, uh, the answers to what they should say and what they should do, but working with them to help them to understand, uh, to, to come up with these, issue, or these responses on, on their own. And, and using kind of rough terminology, instead of giving them a fish, we could teach them how to fish. Um, problem of tithing, uh, provides opportunities. When we problematize something, we're not necessarily saying that, that the issue initially, that the, the stuff in the question that we're talking about is wrong or there's a problem with it. We're simply asking people to revisit something uh, that, they have treated, uh, that they have treated as something that is, is a given and, and uh, ask them to revisit it and think about it. Um, problematizing meets people where they're at and helps them to uh, process and to rethink some of the things that they've taken for granted. Problematizing also provides opportunities for Christians to speak God's truth in the ensuing discussion about the issue at hand. The Holy Spirit can then works to reveal and highlight problems in unbiblical positions on this stuff. So, so um, Christians can join conversations um, not simply by relying on rational arguments, but by raising questions that stimulate their conversation partners to really think about beliefs that they have unquestionably accepted as fact. Uh, in order to pre pre prepare to problematize, we can, learn, uh, we can learn again from wise Christians who are, um, who are responding and then use these responses and teach other, these responses to other people. For example, one of the the pro things that I really enjoyed as I was uh, studying and, and doing my research in Taiwan was, was hearing wise Christians, and I, I chose many of my uh, interviewees to, because I wanted to hear their perspective on, on uh, and the ways that they were uh, handling some of the non-Christian uh, 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 negative categorizations. We can, um, some of the, one of the things that I found that people were using was problematizing the meaning of being filial. Okay, here's a, here's a symbol, here's a word that has a lot of meanings for people in Taiwan. And, and you, you encounter people who have, who have words that have meanings as well that, that, that are associated with them. And, and these wise Christians problematized the, the, the meaning of filial. They said, you know, uh, what does it mean to be filial? They asked that question. 
And, and then they said some people say that, that filial is this, and some people say that, that you can be filial, just, you can just ignore your mom and dad all your life, and if you just at the funeral, if you just go up and bow with incense, that's being filial. And is it really filial, they asked. And isn't filial, um, isn't filial caring for your mom and your dad when it's, when it's hard? When, when, they, when they need your help and not just throwing them into a nursing home, it's a, that's one of the, the things that they, uh, they talk about in, in Taiwan is the kind of the, or, you know, throwing them into a nursing home. Um, and then developing some, some uh, responses uh, using a, a, a three memorial ceremony. So, so uh, uh, when, when at the funeral we have uh, some obstacles, some... Um, some, the, some of the rituals that take place are, are opportunities for people to, to express their, their grief and their, and their honor of the person who has died and their thankfulness and their gratefulness. Um, we develop, the, the, the Hakka Church has developed some rituals and they, instead of some of the rituals that are used in pagan sacrifices, they, they use these rituals as, as, uh, to, to replace some of those things. To offer instead of using using um, uh, incense in 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 rituals, they use flowers and attending some of them attending uh, family gatherings where ancestor rituals take place. Um, problematizing the meaning of foreign is another uh, thing that I found, and and this is. You know what does it mean to be foreign? You say that Christianity is foreign. Are all for, are all ba are all foreign things bad? And one of my one of my several of my uh, interviewees said they used they, they talked about well you know lights come from from uh, America. We used to use kerosene lamps. Clothing um, has come. The clothes that we wear, the houses that we use that are made out of cement that came from the West. Appliances, pens and pencils, the English language. Some of these, uh, these were, were ways to problematize. What does it really mean? And, and it, does it mean that it, just because it's foreign, just because it's connected to foreign, that it's bad? Um, but also um, preparing uh, fresh responses to issues that are not being addressed in, or, or where existing responses are weak or inadequate. And um, these, uh, these some examples could include special activities or sermons or Bible studies or movies or songs or dramas or advertisements or articles or books. Um, and uh, and uh, so one of the things that, that uh, we, just, just to give you an example of one of the things that we, we've done, uh, this was a time, uh, an outreach that uh, we did this summer right shortly before I left Taiwan and and Andy Larson and myself, we decided that we wanted to contest. We wanted to kind of uh, raise the issue that God is different from the gods that you, that you, that are, that are served in the temple. And so we we contextualized the story of the prodigal son. And I became a, a an old old an older man, a father from up in the hills, uh, uh, in an area where we're where we're um, where we're where we're working and. And Andy became a, a son who was unfilial and and did all of the things that that uh, that 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 we were trying to make uh, to help people to feel yeah that guy is bad and and uh, and then he then he turned around and he became the the and then he also played the role of the of the uh, older son and I had somebody one of one of the grandmas who was listening came up and to me afterwards and said. Uh, were you really? Were you telling a story, or is that? Are you really from up uh, living up there? You know, and I thought, oh yes, I'm really, really f felt successful. Um, and problematizing things that as we as we deal with uh, the challenges that people have. One of the one of the, one of my uh, the people that I was interviewing, um, I, I asked him. I said, um, uh, has, has from the time that you are. That you are, uh, that you have, uh, that you you know your family. Have your ancestor rituals changed? And he said, "Absolutely not. Absolutely not. They've oh, we've always done the same thing." And 
And I said, well, you know, somebody else, and here's that issue where I know some other things about this, and here's, here are the voices of others. They're not, voices of, uh, uh, they're not my voices. Voices of others say they've been, they've been changing the way that they do ancestors, the, 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 the sacrifices that they offer to, sac to uh, the ancestors. Oh, yeah, he says, of course, nobody can do all those complicated a a ancestor, uh, the, the come up with all those sacrifices anymore. We've simplified and, uh, and changed things. And so immediately, as we, prob as, as we, the next question becomes, and at that time I was doing research, so I didn't ask the next question. Uh, the next question is, who decides who gets to, who, how, uh, how much change happens? And how do we know how much change can happen? And can, if, we, if it can change, can it change this much? Because Christians also have ways to relate to their ancestors. Being Christian is not about um, is not about doing uh, good things. And one of the things that I don't know, I just, I you know, part of part of our theology tells us that our, our theology tells us that people, uh, when they are justified, they're not sanctified immediately. And one of the things that's so frustrating to deal with is is that Christians in our church, um, I I have people come to me and say, you know, you got that guy in your church, and he's been in your church for ten years now, and he's still doing that thing, and 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 I can't. Uh, God, God gives people grace, and what what we our response to those kinds of things is is to is to help a person see their their need and bring them to Christ. But Christians do not have a good reputation among non Christians sometimes, and so. One of the issues I think is really important is to develop a response to, to what do we do when, the, when, Christians, when, when Christians in some ways are not even as good as, as, as the Christians, as the, as the non-Christians around them. How do we respond to that? What are the, the, uh, the responses that we can come up with? We can develop, uh, this is one of the areas that I feel as, uh, that, that I'm going to be working on in, in, in Taiwan as I, as I um, respond and, and, at, and talk to people about their responses. And, and uh, instead of hammering on people and saying, well, those Christians, we just got to do it better. We just got to be better. Um, we, uh, we, need to, uh, we need to feed people the, the law and the gospel and, and help them to, to understand their relationship with God. But we also need to deal, deal with the fact that people are not going to make, be, they're not going to change sometimes. Okay, um, and so we need to prioritize. Some of the things that, that we've been doing is, is um, uh, we need to develop effective responses by, oh, excuse me, I need to finish that one, uh, <clears throat> in areas that are particularly weak. And so we've done a lot of work in our, in our mission in our, in our church, in the Hakka Church, in, uh, in answering the issue of ancestor worship. But I think we need to r address the issue that I just raised. Christians, uh, uh, many, many non-Christians look at Christians and say, I don't want to be a Christian because um, Christians don't help people become better. And that's the reason why, that's the reason for a religion. And then uh, it's important, I think, to one of the important uh, points that I want to make in this presentation is that is that we develop, we, 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 uh, we view any meaningful engagement as success. And sometimes we, we want to take people from zero, from, from where they are at, all the way to being a Christian. And instead, I want to uh, suggest that we, we, uh, it's important to develop effective responses that help people move one step at a time. And the final lens here, this lens, this final main point, this lens helps us to tr strategically engage non-Christians by highlighting the importance of connecting with, with non-Christians. We can develop connections with non-Christians by intentionally spending time with them. Um, you know, it seems obvious, but do you spend time with non-Christians? Uh, how, how can we develop Christian, uh, we can develop, we, we need to develop, uh, res we need to develop, uh, opportunities to uh, uh, do things that we like to do with non-Christians. And then we can develop not, uh, connections with non-Christians by teaming up with non other Christians. One of the most effective ways that we have in, in reaching people as a missionary is to, is to be a, a tool 
that a national Christian uses to minister to people that they know, to bring us in and to ask us questions, to say, you know, Pastor Ethan is able to help people who have marriage problems. Can he help you? And, and, and uh, value and, and meet them where they are at. We can develop non-Christian uh, connections with non-Christians by sponsoring activities where non-Christians and Christians can be together. And I found that some of the times that we've been together, we had a, a little outreach in our church where we met in the, every Sunday afternoon, we played basketball, went hiking together, and we met at a certain place and people would just come if they, if they wanted to. And, and as we walked together and played together, we had opportunities to, to help people understand that Christians weren't as weird as they, as, we, as they thought they were. And then by highlighting the importance of our lifestyles as we seek to engage non-Christians. And, and thinking, thinking about um, our lifestyle of enjoying God's creation, God and his creation, can be a voice for God that engages non-Christians. Our lifestyle of loving people in the church can be a voice for God that engages non-Christians. Our lifestyle of living in obedience to God can be a voice that engages non-Christians. Um, sometimes uh, Kinnaman and Lyon gives the, give, give the example of, of, a, of a guy who, who was going to uh, Disneyland and, he, and his son was, was younger and he looked younger and he said, you could just, his friend told him, just tell him that he's, that he's too young and then he gets the cheaper price and the, and the man said, no, I'm going to tell him the truth and that became a conversation of, uh, 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 an issue that they talked about. And then finally, our lifestyle of faithfully serving our neighbors and our vocations can be a voice for God that engages non-Christians. And, um, you know, serving, being faithfully present, uh, wanting to, to uh, live out, live out the life uh, the, the, and, and be the best policeman or the best uh, carpenter or the best teacher the best, best professor or the best farmer that I can be uh, is, is, a, is, is a way to contest some of the issues that come up. And then by fi uh, I have two more points here. By, fi by highlighting the importance of interacting with Christians, with non-Christians in the public arena. Uh, the, Lon Allison, the, the director of the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College, uh, gave a presentation in Taiwan this summer and he just highlighted and it was like, yeah. Um, he said, Some, sometimes public proclamation carries more compelling power than a personal interaction can. And so it began to really uh, emphasize for me the importance of a public, of being, in a, of, of being a voice in a public arena where Christian workers can work to cultivate a, a public voice that effectively responds to the, the negative categorizations of non-Christians. Um, for example, presentations in media and literature and well-organized activities that use creative ways to, to respond to negative categorizations of Christianity. Um, I think one of the strengths of this kind of a thing is that uh, this kind of, a, a, of an activity we use uh, in, our, uh, in our setting, we use the, um, uh, we have these mass big ancestor memorial ceremonies and they get on TV and things like that and people can see them and to say and they can say um, you know did you see that on TV uh, this the, 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 the Christians are worse are memorialized are 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 remembering their ancestors and and uh, we can use that and access those kinds of things as as they become part of the public rhetoric that's happening and finally uh, and this is what, uh, by highlighting the importance of interacting with non-Christians in intentional conversations and in actions, getting to where you can talk to somebody about their negative categorizations in a relationship and working to cultivate those kinds of relationships. As I close, I just want to say, you know, this is one, only one lens with which to gain insights into looking at ministry settings. And I hope that it's been fruitful to, to you as I've shared some of these things. And I know that many of you have lots more things. I was hoping to have time to share, to let you uh, share some of those things. And maybe there will be other opportunities on a personal level to share later. But I just want to uh, encourage uh, to be a person, to be a part of a team. And I want to be a part of a team with you, uh, learning how to 
to relate to our culture, learning how to relate to our world, stimulating each other, challenging each other to be servants for God in the freedom of the gospel, not because we have to, to earn God's favor, but because of his love for us. Thanks for the opportunity to share.